underground is sinking sand. Our next hymn will be 193. There's a hill lone and gray in a land far away, in a country beyond the blue sea, where beneath that fair sky, when a man forth to die for the world and for you and for me. Now the tune that I'm going to ask is not the normal tune. Okay, so I don't know if you folks here still remember. If not, I can have you to start it for you. 193. There's a hill on and gray.
once again, it's very good to see all that is able to join us this evening for the preaching of the gospel. And for those that are able to join us listening online as well, thank you for coming. And thank you for listening to the public preaching of the gospel. Now, these meetings continue, as you know, each night, Monday to Friday, 7.30 to 8.30, and Sunday at 7 o'clock. So before we open the scriptures, let us pray and ask for the Lord's blessing on us this evening. Our Father, we express thanks still once more for the, that hill alone and gray. It is a special place. For Father, there was a special person that went there and laid down his life for us. And it is our honor to be able to speak of him, the Son of God, the Son of God that came into the world. We were reminded last evening about the Father who sent his Son in the fullness of time, and we praise thee for this. If he never left heaven to come into the world, we have nothing to live for. We have no message to tell others. There is no hope at all. But we praise thee the Son came and he died. And we thank thee, Father, he lives today in the power of an indestructible life. And as we would declare him this evening, we pray for those that are still without him as their Savior. May they come to know him, know their sins forgiven. Bless us tonight, now we pray, giving thanks in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd like to turn again, please, to 1 Corinthians and chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians and chapter number 15. We were here last night. And I want to visit this passage once again. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the, th on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and so on. Now, I trust the Lord to bless the reading of the Scripture to us once again. I want to talk to you tonight again about the Gospel. The message of the gospel, as Paul, as Paul would try to summarize it very in, briefly here in these number of verses in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. When the Apostle Paul, before the Apostle Paul got to Corinth, around 80, 50 or so, it was a, really in many ways the last destination on a long journey. He started in a city called Antioch in Syria, and he traveled up north to modern day Turkey today. And then he crossed, in the, crossed Turkey until he came to the edge. And due to a number of very interesting events, he crossed the Aegean Sea into the country that we know today as Macedonia. He visited a city called Philippi. Then he went west, quite a number of distance again, to a city called Thessalonica. And then a number of hundred of miles again, he went south to a city called Athens. And then finally, he arrived in the city of Corinth. You know how many miles that was? 1,000 miles. 1,600 kilometers. This man left the comfort of his home, left his friends, left all that he possessed in the city of Antioch. He and his friend Silas, and there was a man called Timothy, there was a man called Luke for a part of that journey. Together, they traveled 1,600 kilometers by land and sea to come to a strange city that they'd never been to before. And when they landed there, the only reason they came to the city of Corinth was to announce this gospel message. That's why we're here tonight. The amazing thing, I find it an incredible privilege of preaching the gospel is this, that I am doing the same thing as Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. They travel the distance, leaving behind the comfort of their home, and they come to a city called Corinth to preach the gospel. This man here traveled even farther. I was looking at Google today by bird's eye fly. 5,000 kilometers. St. John's, Newfoundland. He came all the way from the East Coast to the Best Coast. And he came all the way here, folks, to tell us about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we do it? Why is it that the men down through the generations are prepared to announce this message? Because I want to tell you, there's absolutely no message in the world like this. Because the gospel message we are preaching tonight is absolutely unique and special and incomparable with anything in the world. You say, why is it so special? Well, 
More or less, what I'm going to tell you tonight is what our brother Neil told us last night. What is the gospel? What did you say? You already told us that. He told us that. And I'm not going to tell you in the will of God anything any different. I hope I don't tell you anything any different. In fact, if you come every night, you know with our series of gospel meetings where we basically tell you the same thing in a different formula. That's all we do. So why do we do it? Why do we bother telling people the same thing over and over again each night? Does it not get boring? Does it not get tedious? Well, I take encouragement from this fact. That when the Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, he wrote it to believers. Could you believe it? He was writing to believers that have been saved for at least five years. They've heard the gospel. They preach the gospel on a regular basis. They know exactly what Paul was going to say when he said, I declare unto you the gospel. But he still told them anyways. Because you know why? Because Christians need to hear the gospel. Dear brother and sister, my fellow believers, I hope we never lose sight of that. No matter how long we have been saved, no matter how well acquainted we know the gospel, we still need to hear the gospel because there's nothing like it. And he presents to them the gospel once again. If you're not saved tonight, do you know why you need to hear the gospel? Because you haven't believed it yet. And you need to be reminded again and again and again that we trust in the will of God. You will come to realize this is true. I need to be saved. The only way for a person to come to the knowledge of faith is by hearing God's word on a regular basis. And we are seeking to do that precisely tonight. While well, you say that, what is so special about the gospel? Well, you notice that in verse number, um, starting at the end of verse number three, Paul makes four statements. Okay? Christ died for our sins, statement number one. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And he was seen. In every one of those four statements, there's one thing that's in common. Him. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He was seen. It's all about Christ. Would you like to know tonight why the gospel message is so special? Because it's all about him. Not about us. Paul didn't travel 1,600 kilometers to come to the city of Corinth to talk about themselves. There's a lot of people that do that, you know. They're actually willing to go through the tediousness of traveling just to promote themselves. Politicians do this all the time. Businessmen do this all the time. People in marketing do this all the time because they are trying to do all that to advertise themselves, not these men. Because these men were trying to advertise someone, announce someone that is greater than themselves. And in fact, he's the greatest man that has ever existed in this world. And he's the greatest man that is still living today. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. He was seen. It's all about Christ. When I was just at this past conference, there's a brother that, um, um, he's from Vancouver Island. And he tells me that his father-in-law from Vancouver Island tunes into our gospel meetings in, in, in at Victoria Drive every Sunday. He goes on Facebook and logs into it. And he hears it every Sunday. He's not saved. And he is actually, because he hears us so much and he gets to know all the different individuals that, we, that come to Victoria Drive and speak, he, he has a little criteria now as to how he judges the gospel message. In fact, he told me that he actually has a nickname for all of us that preach the gospel. That's how strict the criteria got. He has a nickname. I like to know what my nickname is. But that's what he did. Would you like to know how you're supposed to judge a gospel message? I hope you do judge, by the way. The Bible says you're supposed to judge. But here's the right way, the most important criteria. Do we talk about Christ? Because a Christless gospel sermon is not a gospel message. If the gospel meeting, you don't hear about Jesus Christ, you are doomed. Because it's all about him. I want to tell you tonight that he is not just that he's the son of God from heaven. And if you think that the distance that Paul traveled and the sacrifice he made to come all the way to Corinth, if you think that's incredible, that's nothing. You think 5,000 kilometers a lot? That's nothing. You take all the commute time that every single person in this room and add them all together as to how long it took you to get to this gospel meeting and you multiply that by 10,000 times 10,000 and that doesn't even begin to describe the distance the Son of God took. 
when he left the throne of heaven and he came into this world. That's how far he came. He left the splendors of heaven, God's own son who dwelt in the bosom of his heavenly father for all eternity. He left it all. And blessed be his name, he came into the world. And Paul says, Paul says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sin. We heard about it last night. The Father sent the Son, sent forth in the fullness of time. God sent forth His own Son. In another passage, John would tell us, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. There's no birth like the birth of Christ. He came for this purpose, to save you from your sins. That's why we preach Him. There's nobody else better There's nobody else that's worthy of the announcement as such. And I want to tell you tonight, not only is Christ worthy of announcement, he's worthy of your acceptance. Because you need him to be in heaven. Well, you say then, that's great. It's about him. What else? Well, Christ did a lot of things. When he came, he performed miracles. He healed people that were, you know, there were no doctors in those days that could deal with leprosy. There are people that are dead. And there are definitely no doctors that could deal with dead people. And Christ came and he did the impossible and he did all these miracles. Ah, but Paul said, that's not what I want to tell you about. When Paul takes, begins to summarize the essence of the gospel, he mentions absolutely nothing about the miracles he performed. He says nothing about Christ walking on water or calming the storm. He says this, Christ died. You say, well, that's tall. Anticlimactic? You're going to tell me this is the greatest message and you travel this far to come to Corinth about a man that died? Sure, people die every single day of it. There's nothing like his death. This is not the death of an ordinary man. He said, Christ died for your sins. That's the uniqueness of the death of Christ. He came into the world because there's a problem we all have and we were hearing about it last night and it's your sins. It's my sins. Our sins that will keep us out of heaven for all eternity. The biggest problem you have is not the gas prices. The biggest problem you have is not acing your exams. The biggest problem you have is not about whether or not you can get a job. The biggest problem you have is this, your sins. Because if you die in your sins, you will be in hell forever. Is it that serious? That serious? Our Bible reading on Sunday, back home at Victoria Drive, we, we, we've been doing the story of the book, first book of Samuel. We've never done that before, so that was, that was interesting. I, I've been thoroughly enjoying this. So we're now in the life of Saul. There were two things that Saul did that, got, that, that made him lose his kingship. You know, you know, you know how Saul, God basically got rid of Saul, replaced Saul from being king over two things. You know what it was? One day, Saul was in a city called Gilgal, and he was kind of just, you know, he, he, he was waiting, to, um, he was waiting to, to, to go to war, okay? But Samuel specifically told him, before you go out to war, you got to wait for me to come for the sacrifice. Saul, you got to wait for seven days. So Saul's sitting there, he's getting all anxious. You know, the war is coming, and we're getting invaded and all this. So, okay, okay, well, seven days. Well, there you go, seven times 24 hours. There we go, we got it. And he couldn't wait for Samuel any longer. He lost his patience and he offered the sacrifice. And Samuel said, you crossed the line. But she said, he got a little impatient. That's a sin. And it was so serious that he lost the kingship of Israel just for being impatient. You ever been impatient? When things don't just go your way and you can't wait any longer, God says that's sin. And God said that will get you out of my kingdom. And you will not be king over that. You know what the next thing he did was? God told him. He put him on a mission to do, this, do something. And Saul said, oh, that's, that's a little harsh. That's a little complicated. I, I'll, do, I'll do about 80%. Okay, I'm not going to go the 100%. More. I'll do 80%. And the 20%, I'll do something else. I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it up for God. God says no. 80% done is not done. 80% obedience to my word is not obedience to my word. 80% obedience is disobedience. 
Ever get anything halfway done? God says, don't lie. Well, well, I'll tell, I'll tell, don't tell the whole truth. I'll tell part of the truth and I'll tell... No, no, no. That's disobedience. Even incomplete obedience is sin. And Samuel had to come right then and right there and tell him, Saul, you lost the kingdom because of that. Sin is serious. And would you like to know how, why, why it is so serious? And why here in this passage God demonstrates it's so serious? Because Christ died for your sins. It, only, it took the death of Christ, the Lord of glory, and to come into this world to die for your sins. Because that's how serious it is. Because there is no other way for you to be in heaven beside this. Christ died for your sins. Actually, I think I'd be misquoting that, haven't I? It doesn't say Christ died for your sin. It says Christ died for our sins. In fact, Paul got even a little more personal. He said the gospel, he said, I deliver unto you the gospel, first of all, that which I also received. Could I tell you another reason why these men were willing to sacrifice so much and travel the distance to come to preach to these men this gospel message because it personally affected them. There was a day in Paul's life when he saw the blinding light of the exalted Christ in heaven and he personally received the word of God and he came to realize Christ didn't just die for these people. It's not just Christ died for your sins. No, no. Paul put himself right in there with the people and he said Christ died for our sins. My sin. You want to know why we do this what we do here? Because there was a day in our life when we came to know the Savior where we received his word. Two days ago, I could hardly believe this. Two days ago, May 13, 2023, and 20 years prior to that, that's when I received the message. I've been saved for 20 years now. Hard to believe that. 2003, on May 13, in a series of gospel meetings like this, I left that gospel meeting and I wasn't saved. And I got home. And I started reading this book. And I want to tell you, by the way, if you want to get saved, you need to read this book. If you want to get saved and you're not reading your Bible, you're not interested in getting saved. I got home that night on May 13, 2003, and I started reading this book because I wanted to get saved. And I personally received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and my life has never been the same ever again. Dear friend, in this gospel meeting tonight, I know from experience what God can do for a sinner. And I want to tell you tonight, he can do it for you. It is worthy of announcement. Oh, but there's more than that. This gospel isn't just great because of the person that we preach. The gospel isn't just great because of the purpose that it has, to, that he can take away your sin. But it's a death that was according to the scripture. In other words, it has the greatest plan that was ever executed. Because when Christ died on the cross, that was not some sort of an accident that happened. Everything that took place at the death of Christ happened exactly according to Scripture. I find this amazing. You remember when the soldiers took the Lord Jesus and nailed him to the cross? And they took, they took his clothing, they took everything, his robes and all that, and they started to gamble for it. And as soon as they started gambling for his clothes, the Bible says that they might be fulfilled according to what it says in the book of the Psalms. Okay? And then a little later, a man took a spear and he pierced the side of the Lord Jesus. And as soon as he, John described that action, he says that they might be fulfilled. And then something else happened. He took a look at the Lord Jesus and he said he's already dead. So I'm not going to break his legs. And as soon as he decided not to do something, that aim might be fulfilled. So when he chooses to do something, that aim might be fulfilled. When he chooses not to do something, that aim might be fulfilled. You, you ever, you ever okay, all the kids here, you, you play chess, okay? You ever, wait, 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 what, what, what was the last stage when you get, is it checkmate? I don't play chess that much. Is, is that what they call it, checkmate? You know what that means when, when they checkmate you? It means there's nothing you can do that you can, that you, that you can win. You move this way, you lose. You move this way, you lose. That's what was happening at the cross. They do something, God's will is fulfilled. They don't do something, God's will is fulfilled. Because everything that took place at Calvary 
was planned long before this world was ever created. God, from the beginning, loved you so much that he planned it before you even existed to send his own son to die exactly according to the plan that he had in mind before the world began so that you can trust in Jesus Christ and have your sins forgiven. Lastly, why is this gospel worth preaching? Because he has produced some of the greatest products in this world. There's nothing like it. You see this man that was preaching this message back in here, 1 Corinth? You know what he was? He was a rebellious sinner. He murdered Christians. He locked them up in prison. And you know what God did to him? He changed his life so much. And they taught him, set him on a course that he would be preaching the gospel all across the world. There's a lady called Mary Magdalene. Afflicted with all sorts of spiritual problems. The Bible says she was possessed by seven demons. And she met the person of Christ. And he changed her. She's never the same again. I look, you know, you know, and on a Sunday morning, on a Sunday morning, I like just to take a look around at the assembly where I am from. And I like to look at some of the individuals. There's quite a, about, about a third of the assemblies are first generation Christians like myself. And it's just wonderful just to take a look at the different backgrounds of how people, where they came from and, and how the gospel has come into their lives. And, you know, there's a lady there. She, she was actually dying a few, a month or so ago. She's, she's fine now, Juanita. I would love to, I love to visit her, visit her. It's a trophy of the grace of God. You know what she did before she got saved? She smoked marijuana every single day. You know why she did it? It's not because she enjoyed it. She smoked pot every day because that was the only way she, she knew how to cope with the griefs and sorrows of life. Numb herself. There was so much going on in her life, she couldn't cope with it. So a little bit of plant and burn it all up. Kill a little brain cells so she can cope with the affairs of this life. I want to tell you tonight, the gospel came into her life. She got saved. You know how she got saved? She got saved by reading Psalm 51 all by herself. And she read the words against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this wickedness. And she came as a guilty sinner and fall, fell on her knees. And she trusted Christ as her personal savior. And she'd been changed. You see all these people in Corinth? They were a bad bunch. Some of them, the, the Bible says, some of them were idolaters. Some of them were involved in fornication. Some of them were this. Some of them were that. But Paul says the gospel came. And here's what happened. You were now justified. You were now sanctified. And if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, I guarantee you on the authority of this book, he will do a work in your life that you have never seen before. He will change you for heaven. He will change you for glory. How do you do it? Well, it says about these Corinthians, which also ye have received. You've got to receive it for yourself. You've got to make the personal choice, every single one of you, to not just hear the gospel, when the Bible says Jesus Christ, Christ died for our sins, you are prepared to receive that personally and say, he died for my sins. And when a man and woman and boy and girl does that, God changes them forever. This is why this message is worth preaching. May God bless this word, bless you tonight. I'm reading now the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. <clears throat> and you've been hearing all about our Lord Jesus Christ. And that, as Brother Jack has been mentioning, that is the sum and substance of the Gospel. Uh, if we miss Christ and Christ crucified, then we really haven't preached the Gospel. So I, I want to take what we've been hearing and focus for you all, all of that message just in one question. So we're going to read in Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 41. <clears throat> Matthew 22 and verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? 
Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He said unto them, How then doth, does David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou in my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? And so, and, and no man was able to answer him a word, and neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. It's really the five words that we have noticed in the uh, verse number 42 that I want to look at tonight. What do you think of Christ? What do you personally think about Christ? You see, the, the question is not what do you know about Christ? Brother Jack has been telling us exactly a, a, a lot of things about Christ, and I'm speaking to an audience here, and you would, you would know a, a great deal about Christ. You would know that he was born in Bethlehem. His mother was Mary, grew up in Nazareth. He was known as the carpenter's son. And on, you, you know a lot about Christ, but that's not the question. The question is, what do you think of Christ? Or could I just put it maybe a bit more personal? What does he mean to you? What does he really mean to you personally at this moment? You know, it's interesting that Matthew chapter 22 is a, is a chapter filled with all kinds of questions. And uh, questions are, are important. In fact, I, over the next few nights, I want to look at some of the key Bible questions that uh, are contained in the scripture. Because you see, questions focus things for us. Questions kind of wade through all the, the incidental things of life and they, they, they bring the real issue into view. And questions not only focus things, but they require a response. And that's exactly why the Lord Jesus asked this question. What, what do you think about Christ? It's interesting that the Pharisees had come, and, and there was a big question about taxation, and they were trying to trip him up. And then the Pharisees, they came, and they said, well, now, we're, we're, we're interested in the resurrection and marriage as, you know, in the resurrected state. And then there was a lawyer that came, and he said, uh, tell me, what, what is the greatest commandment? And after all these questions had been asked, then the Lord says, I'm going to ask you a question. And the question is simply this, what do you think? of Christ. Could I tell you that is, the, that is the greatest question that you will ever face? And that is the only issue that will determine where you will be forever. Uh, I'm sure every one of us here have had to face questions and issues in our life, different factors to, to, to deal with. But you know when it comes to this factor and this question, It'll determine whether you be in heaven or in hell. What do you think about Christ? Interestingly, isn't it that 2,000 years have passed and in this world of ours, he's either loved or he's hated. He's either worshipped or he's ridiculed. Have you ever asked yourself, now why, why do people use his name to turn the air blue, you know, to, to swear and tear people down. Why do they use his name? Why not somebody else's name? Because he means nothing to them. And they don't mind dragging his, his name in the, in the dust. But tonight, we're not talking about people out there. We're talking about individuals in this present audience and any that have joined us on Zoom tonight. And the big question is, what do you think about Christ? I want to tell you just some of, the, some of the things concerning this question because, number one, you cannot explain Christ in human terms, merely in human terms. We've been reminded that he was more than just a man, but he was a real man. But he was more than a man. He was the eternal Son of God. And as we mentioned last night, verily God yet become truly human. He became what he had never been before, but he never stopped being what he'd always been. In fact, it's interesting that when you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, his biography, the, the story of his life was actually written before he was born. And that's an amazing thing, isn't it? I'm looking at parents here. 
and there are some young families here. And some of us are a little bit down the road, and uh, we now have grandchildren. But I can tell you one thing, that there's not a parent here in, in this building tonight that sat down before their Johnny was born and began to write out an account of what that life would be. My Johnny is going to be a brain surgeon, or my Mary is going to be a, a, a corporate lawyer. Parents have dreams and aspirations and hopes but nobody writes a biography as to what their Johnny is going to be. And yet when we look at this unique person, his biography was written before he was born. 750, 800 years involved a prophet by the name of Isaiah, and he wrote about him. And he, one day he picked up his pen, he says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> that's quite a claim, isn't it? Unto us a child is born. Well, that, that's, not, that's not a problem. Unto us a son is given. Well, that's a bit more specific. And then all of a sudden, the, the greatness of his power is going is to come into focus, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 750 or 800 years later, that's exactly what happened. The same prophet wrote one day, a virgin, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Did it happen? It did. It did. And tonight, as you look at this unique person, you can't explain the greatness of his life, merely in human terms or in philosophical terms. In fact, as we look at Bethlehem, we understand that he had a birth, but he had no beginning. Now, that does not apply to any of us. All of us have had births. And here we are, alive, well, breathing. We had a beginning. But when this child was born, he had a real birth, but he had no beginning. He said, I don't understand. No, I don't either. Because the Bible is as great as the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in flesh. And you know, as the story unfolds, we understand that his birth, first bed was a cattle manger. None of us have ever experienced that. There were wise men that came from the east, grown men, traveled miles. And these grown men, they actually bowed their knees before a little child. Uh, I, I, maybe I should mention this, but I remember when our first child was born and my parents uh, drove from Ontario to Newfoundland and uh, they came into the house and they were glad to see us, I think, but they says, where is he? They wanted to see their new grandson. I says, come on. And uh, we went down the little hallway of our little house there, and they looked at their little grandson for the very first time. And I just happened to look at my dad, and there was a, just a couple of tears on his cheeks. But they never bowed the knee, and they never worshipped him. No, that wouldn't, wouldn't be right. But these grown men, they got down on their knees, and they presented unto this child gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. The age of 12, there was a group of doctors and lawyers and the, and, and the big people of society, and they were gathered around this 12-year-old, not even a teenager, 12-year-old boy. And they were shaking their heads. In fact, the Bible says, all that heard him, all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. He says, how does he know this? Where does he get this? He's never been to UBC. He's never been to university. How does he know this? Oh, my dear friend, you can't explain Christ just in human terms. And that's why this question, what do you think about Christ? What does he mean to you? Is the greatest issue of your life. I'm wondering if maybe I'm speaking to someone here and you know all about him. But he doesn't mean that much to you. Zero. 
you like the intent to be saved someday. But as far as Christ is concerned, not right now. You know, as you look at, the, at, at his life, you, you, you get a little glimpse of his tremendous power. There was this moment when there, were, there was a very large crowd, 5,000 men, very possibly plus women and children. So who knows, 10,000, maybe 15,000, I, I don't know, but 5,000 for sure. And uh, the need was, was evident. They, they needed some food. And uh, boy, he had a little lunch, five little buns of bread and two little fishes, two little fish. He said, bring them to me. And he took that little lunch, gave thanks, and they began to break basket there, and he broke it. Okay, Peter, you go over there. John, bring your basket. And, and he kept breaking the, the loaves and the fish. And 5,000 individuals, very likely more than that, were filled. It wasn't just a matter of they had a little, just a little tidbit. No, they had as much as they wanted. Did it really happen? Yes, it did. Other times they were crossing the Sea of Galilee there. Just a small body of water, but sometimes you get pretty big storms. And as Jesus was asleep in the back part of the ship, the storm broke and the waves were breaking over that little ship. And the wind was howling. And they finally woke him up. And they said, Master, are, are, are you not concerned? Don't you care that we're going to sink? We're going down? And they watched as the Savior who had been asleep got up from that hard bed. And with words of power, he says, Peace! Be still! I'm, I'm not sure he even raised his voice. <coughs> Peace! Be still! And the wind stopped like that. And the sea went flat calm. And grown men had weathered many a storm. They says, what kind of a man is this? that even the wind and the sea, they obey him. You see, my dear friends, you're, you're, you're not just dealing with an ordinary man. You're dealing with the Christ of God, the Savior of sinners that desires to be your Savior. And as you listen to his words, you hear these words, I have power to lay down my life. I have power to take it up again. Now, if any of us would say those words, you'd be absolutely right to go home because it'd be absolute nonsense. We have no power to take our life up again. But this man says, I have power to do that and I have power to take it up again. And exactly as he said there upon the cross, as we've been hearing, he died for our sins. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's why he came. <clears throat> he came to lay down his life. He came to shed precious blood. He came to pay a debt he did not owe because we had a debt we could not pay. We needed someone to take our sins away. And he says, that's why I've come. And he died. And as Brother Jack has been telling us, it's not just an historical fact, though it is. There's a great truth. Christ died. Don't stop there. Christ died for our sins. And that makes all the difference. But that's not the end of the story, is it? <coughs> Three days later, he came back to life again. And today he is living in the power of an endless life. There will never be another Calvary. There will never be another sacrifice for sin. He finished the work. And tonight, what you think about Christ, what he means to you personally, is the greatest issue of your life. Let me tell you something else very quickly. You can't explain Christ in human terms, but you can't equal Christ with regard to anybody else. You cannot equal Christ. He stands absolutely unique. In fact, when you look at his life, you understand that he had power over sin. His was a life of absolute perfection. In fact, everyone that came in contact with him was made aware of this. 
He has no sin. Peter says he did no sin. <coughs> John said in him is no sin. Paul says he knew no sin. And tonight, when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand that he is the man who has been marked by absolute perfection. No sin, no blemish. In fact, when you listen to Pilate, the Roman governor having examined him, he says, I can't find any fault in this man. You've examined him? Yes, I have. And there's no reason for death. There's no, there's no reason for condemnation. I should release him. And then Judas comes, <coughs> bringing the 30 pieces of silver with which he had bargained for to betray Christ. And he threw them down. He says, I have sinned to betray the innocent blood. And then, of course, there's the thief on the cross right alongside of Christ. And he calls over to his, I was going to say his buddy, well, his comrade in crime. He says, don't you fear God? We're here because we deserve to be here. But this man, this man has done nothing amiss. Nothing amiss. And today as you look at Christ, you understand that he is the, the sinless, sinless, spotless lamb of God. You see, why is that important? That's important because, my dear friend, he came to put away our sin. And if he, even only had just, if he only had one sin of his own, then he could not be our Savior. But, oh, he came to deal with our greatest problem, as we've been hearing. And willingly, he poured out his soul into death. He paid the great debt in full. And tonight, he stands as the unique Christ. You cannot equal Christ. I'll tell you something else. You can't exclude Christ from your life. Oh, you say, I, I'm getting on pretty well without him. Yes, you can live without Christ. But you see, he has, he has cast a, a, a large shadow on this world. In fact, our, our calendar is divided because of Christ. He, he has influenced culture and, and the arts, the poetry and the music and, and, the, and the paintings and all of this. Many times they focus on Christ because... He's affected a lot of people. And yet, sadly, despite his influence and despite the fact that he, he moves with, with a tremendous interest and a personal interest in you, yes, people are still keeping him at arm's length. And maybe I'm speaking to someone here, and that's, that's your experience. You've really not responded to him. You've never said, Lord, I, I, I need a Savior. I'm, I'm lost. No, you're getting on with life just quite, quite well. And maybe you're convinced that maybe down the road, down the road I'll get saved, but not right now. I want to tell you tonight that he is still seeking lost sinners. <coughs> and that's an amazing thing. And that's a wonderful thing. That as we look at this audience, and, and I don't know where you're coming from, and I don't know what your attitude has been, but I do know this. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And despite your lack of interest and despite your lack of response, he's still pressing to find you. Not that he doesn't know where you are, but he draws alongside. And as you look at the scripture, you find that he, he traveled miles I should say kilometers here in Canada to just look out for one person. He must needs go through Samaria, John chapter 4 tells us. And there was this poor, this poor broken woman who had been through so many relationships. What a sad life. What a tragic life. He must go that way to meet that one broken woman. And tonight he has come to Abbotsford in the gospel because he has you in mind. You can't exclude him. Yes, you can resist him. But he continues to press in on your life through the Spirit of God and through the circumstances of life because he desires to give you the greatest blessing. Let me tell you something else. You'll never escape Christ. Do you understand that? That you will never escape 
Christ. I realize that in this world there's a lot of people and they are convinced that when they die, that's, that's the end of it. And uh, they live that way and they die that way and they're convinced that that's all there is to it. You know what the Bible says? Revelation chapter 20 says, And I saw the dead, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before him. Who's that? That's Christ. That's the one who died for our sins. I saw the dead. It was a great white judgment throne and him who sat upon it from whose face the earth and heavens fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before him. And the books were opened. And the Bible says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Why is that? Because they never received Christ. Because they never accepted the remedy. Because they never appreciated the sin bearer. Because they thought that they would never, never have to meet him. But my dear friend, you will never, never, never escape Christ. Remember, I have a good friend on the coast of Labrador. And uh, Sandy grew up in a home in which there was very little gospel. But she married a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Clyde. And Clyde, Clyde grew up under the sound of the gospel. But Clyde had no time for the gospel. It just they, they tell me he, he, he would turn the air blue, if you understand what that means, with his oaths and his cursing. He, he, he was a very foul-mouthed man. But he married Sandy, and uh, they happened to move back to the coast of Labrador, uh, Lance Lou, and it just happened to be at conference time. And uh, the conference there at Lance Lou was a great time. And uh, so some of, the, some of the believers invited Sandy to come. Now, she had never heard the gospel. So she came, and she heard, heard, heard about salvation, and she heard about judgment, and she heard about Christ. And she came home, and uh, Clyde had gone to bed. And uh, she woke him up and she says, Clyde, Clyde, what's this business about hell? Oh, he says, don't worry about it. There's nothing to it. Oh, no, she said, if, if that is true, then that's an awful place. And you know, dear Sandy was awakened to understand that she had an appointment with the one on the middle of, of, on that great white throne. And she says, I'm not ready. Trusted Christ. And wonderfully, about 15 years later, Clyde finally got saved, and that was a wonderful moment. And my dear friend, if you never receive Christ, you will one day stand before him. I want to tell you one more thing before I close. Because you could enjoy Christ tonight. You could. You could come into the greatest blessing of knowing him as your personal savior. We were having some tent meetings in Midland, Ontario, and uh, it was interesting that one night, uh, very unexpectedly, there was, a, there was a gentleman, and he was, he was a senior uh, with a capital S. He was 89 years of age, and he came in a wheelchair with, a, with an oxygen tank attached to the back of the, the wheelchair, and they wheeled him in, and I said to my brother, I said, who's that? He said, I, I don't know. We discovered that it was Archie Cook, and Archie's son, Gary, had been saved for a number of years and had tried to get his dad to come and hear the gospel. And Archie always says, Gary, I'm just too busy. Don't have time for it. Well, at 89, he finally got time to come and hear the gospel. And he just didn't come once. He came back the next night and he came back the next night and uh, began to sense that something was happening. And on a Friday night, I think of the second week, his granddaughter came over and she says, Grandpa wants to talk to you. So we went over to the car and he says, well, Skipper, what's, what's on your mind? He said, I just want to tell you that I got saved today. I got saved today. And he said to Brother Ardell Adams, who they were living in the same retirement home, he says, you know, I, I don't know why I didn't do this years ago. Because I'd never had peace like I have at this moment. 
Salvation doesn't solve all of life's problems. Christians still get headaches and Christians still get cancer and Christians still have sorrows and tough times and they lose their job. And No. But salvation brings peace to the soul. And the absolute assurance of heaven. You see, the best is yet to come for a Christian. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a I'm thankful to be a Christian, to know Christ as my Savior. There's a day coming when I'm going to be in his presence forever, and I don't deserve it one least little bit. But his salvation brings an individual into the enjoyment of an eternal relationship. So let me come right back to the question. What does Christ mean to you tonight? He said, I don't know. Well, that means he means nothing to you, really. Because when you look at the scripture, when you look at the individuals that responded to Christ, without any, any hesitation to say, he is altogether lovely. That's what Solomon said. Thomas, come and tell this audience about what the Lord Jesus means to you. My Lord and my God. John, tell this audience what he means to you. Oh, we love him. We love him because he first loved us. And on and on it goes. Paul, you should, you should say something to this audience. Oh, yes. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. I don't have the vocabulary to describe it. But Christ means everything to me, he could say. What does he mean to you? I have to tell you as I close, for 22 years almost he meant nothing to me. But tonight he means everything. You take Christ out of my life and I have nothing. You put Christ into the equation, into the factors of life, and he changes everything. That's why, my dear friend, you can't be neutral with regard to Christ. And I trust tonight as we pray that you will receive him by faith. Accept him. Understand it was my sins for which he was dying. And receive him as your Savior, shall we pray. Father, we're thankful tonight for the scripture that tells us so clearly that Christ died for our sins. We're thankful, Lord, that the work of the, of the, of the cross was sufficient to save every individual that has ever lived or will ever live. Not a limited atonement, but sufficient to save everyone. And we're thankful, Father, for each individual that has responded to receive Christ as their Savior to understand that he died for their sins. And Father, many of us tonight are able to say, happy day when Jesus washed our sins away. Pray, Lord, for those who have come here tonight and those who have joined us on Zoom and pray that thy word will be blessed, Christ will be honored, and individuals will respond to him as we give thanks in our Savior's name. Amen. Let's sing a verse of hymn number three tonight. Hymn number three, thanks so much for coming. As you've been reminded, the meetings are continuing each night at 7.30 through the week, 7 o'clock on Sunday. And uh, if you have any questions, if what has been said here tonight is not clear, and uh, that could well be the case, then please don't hesitate to, to ask us. Um, we're approachable. There's no pressure. We don't have altar calls here. Uh, we don't take up an offering, a collection. No, we're, we're here to offer you what God is offering the greatest gift of salvation. Hymn number three, again, the blessed gospel. I have heard that word divine and true, and God again has spoken to my soul. Oh, now what shall I do? And you notice the chorus, I come, I come. I come to thee, my God, I do thy love believe. I do accept, there it is, I do accept thy gift of life and peace. I do thy son receive. Just verse three. Time is gone. Verse 3 of hymn number 3.